Lesson on sound. Sound waves are longitudinal waves. As you see here, the sound waves created by the speaker are creating differences in air pressure or density in these air molecules. Where the air is more dense, that is a compression. Where the air is less dense, that's a rarefaction. This is where air is the medium for these sound waves and the direction of propagation would be from the speaker to your ear. Sound has all the same characteristics of any wave, that is frequency or pitch, period, wavelength, which we can measure from the start of one compression to the start of the next, or from one rarefaction to the next rarefaction. The velocity of sound is also a special number. Commonly in air, it's around 340 meters per second. This speed of sound is commonly referred to as Mach 1, and is 340 meters per second, whereas Mach 2 would be twice the speed of sound, Mach 3, three times, etc. We'll measure what the speed of sound is in our room in a few days, as the speed of sound depends on temperature, and thus 340 meters per second is an average speed. Behaviors of sound waves. Sound waves can exhibit all the same behaviors of reflection, refraction, and diffraction as we saw in other waves in class. You can imagine yourself standing right here in front of a wall. Well, if you yelled at that wall, the sound would come back at you and you would hear your echo. That would be sound reflecting off of the wall. You also learn by using the app on the iPad about sound refraction and that the velocity of sound depends on temperature, which is why in the daytime you can't hear sound over long distances but at nighttime, as sound goes into the air, it refracts and changes direction and comes back down to the ground, thus illustrating the fact that the speed of a wave depends on the medium. And it's also true that sound waves diffract. Here we have someone yelling between uh, two walls here. If sound did not diffract, it would just go straight through this opening, and this person right here wouldn't be able to hear the other person. However, since sound waves do diffract, just like water waves through an opening, as this person speaks, those sound waves actually spread out and curve, and thus the person standing right here can hear those sound waves due to the sound actually spreading out in all directions. Resonance. This is an, another behavior exhibited by all waves, but sound is just a great example of it. First, we have to understand the concept of natural frequency. That is, it's the frequency an object vibrates at naturally. Just as you rang the glass in class and heard it singing at its natural frequency. So there we're having the glass vibrate at its natural frequency. When we force an object to vibrate at its natural frequency, we call that resonance. So that's forcing an object to vibrate at its natural frequency due to something else vibrating at the same frequency. So as you took these two tuning forks here in class, as both were the same frequency, as you rang one tuning fork, that caused the other tuning fork to vibrate at its frequency due to this tuning fork vibrating at the same frequency. And there you can hear it vibrating at that same frequency. But now if I change the frequency, or change its natural frequency by moving this little uh, thing down, then when we ring this tuning fork, it will no longer be at this tuning fork's natural frequency, and you won't hear it vibrate or resonate in response. And there we hear no sound of that tuning fork. Now typically with resonance, this often results in waves of increased amplitude or energy. So the question is, could JT sing at the right frequency of this glass, but also with enough energy or enough amplitude to actually break the wine glass? So let's see if JT could break the glass. Well, I don't think so right now, but we'll check out a Mythbusters episode where a singer sings at the same frequency as a glass and attempts to break it. Beats. This is when two sounds of slightly different frequencies result in alternating constructive and destructive interference. 
What you heard in class from these two speakers was the beat frequency. That is the difference in the frequency of this speaker compared to this speaker. That is the beat frequency is equal to the absolute value of the difference in frequencies of the sounds. Let's check out what you heard in class. So those beats that you hear, when you hear it slightly louder, that's when these waves are constructively interfering from one speaker to another. When you hear it slightly quieter, that's when they're destructively interfering from one to another. And we can calculate that beat frequency. The frequency of this speaker was 300 hertz, and this one I turned up to 302 hertz. So let's calculate that beat frequency right now. Well, that beat frequency will be the difference between 300 and 302 hertz and result in two beats per second or a beat frequency of two hertz. Let's see if we increase the frequency to 305 hertz in the speaker on the right. As you can hear, the number of beats increased, and we can calculate that again by taking the difference in frequencies. So this difference in 300 to 305 hertz gives us five beats per second or a beat frequency of five hertz. The Doppler effect. This is the apparent change in frequency of sound due to the motion of the source of sound. So here we have a police car traveling to the right. As it's moving, the observer that it's moving towards observes it at a slightly higher pitch or frequency. As the source moves away from the other observer, she hears a sound of lower pitch or lower frequency. You observe this phenomena in the ripple tank using water waves. Here we had Sheldon on the left and Raj on the right. And we started by just making waves of a constant frequency with a stationary source. As we did that, you could see that each person will agree on the frequency or wavelength of these waves. That is, Raj will say that the wavelength of these waves is this amount. And Sheldon will also agree that they're the same wavelength or frequency on this side as well. But what happens when the source starts moving away from Sheldon and towards Raj? So here you can see that the wavelength and frequency both change. And if we can rewind that back for a moment and freeze frame it, here's a great picture. So if we can sketch in those waves, here the waves look like this. And now, if, according to both these gentlemen, they're going to measure the wavelength and frequency differently. Raj will observe the frequency, the wavelength, sorry, like this, unless the waves are at a higher frequency. Sheldon will observe the wavelength to be much longer, and thus the frequency to be lower. They're both hearing the Doppler effect, but it differs whether it's approaching them or moving away from them. As seen here, that moving towards Raj, he would hear a high frequency and observe a shorter wavelength than Sheldon, who the source is moving away from, would observe a lower frequency and observe a longer wavelength. This is true of all waves, sound waves, water waves, and even light waves. Doppler effect mathematics for honors, physics. So we can calculate what that observed frequency of the listener is. If those were sound waves moving towards Raj and away from Sheldon, we could calculate the frequency observed by the listener. That depends directly on the frequency of the source of waves multiplied by 1 divided by 1 plus or minus the velocity of the source divided by the velocity of sound, which is 340 meters per second. So this velocity of source is what's critical. The faster the source moves with respect to the observers, the greater the difference observed in frequency by the listeners. You would add this when the source is moving away from the listener. You would subtract this when the source is moving towards the listener. Thank you for watching and see you in class.